I'll tell you, there's no place like this place. So this must be the place. Now let's let's start off with this sound just right. I think you've got it. Don't touch it again. I think you've got it now. Uh, we are talking on Tuesday night about love and about marriage. A little bit of courtship in there. Uh, we want you to know that we're going to do our part to make marriage what it ought to be. Uh, to uh, secure some marriages that may be shaky right now. Uh, we are serious about that. Uh, they've got some statistics out right now about uh, uh, marriage that says that three marriages out of every five in America end in divorce. That is a major catastrophe. And if anybody can help it, the pulpit can. I said if anybody can help it, the pulpit can. And on Tuesday night, I've got some very sound advice. Uh, if you've been married a long time and you've gotten lazy on the job, we're going to stir you up. So you wives, bring your husbands out here Tuesday night, and I'll tell him everything that you've been wanting to tell him. Is that clear? And you husbands, get your wives out here and I'll tell her what you've been wanting to tell her. And it's going to be a time Tuesday night. That's one reason we're going to give you a little rest. Because you're going to need a strong constitution for a Tuesday night. Don't miss it. Now tonight, what Jesus said about hell. Every sermon is what Jesus said about that topic. Now, I dare say that nobody's ever given you a study quite like this, where what Jesus has had to say about the subject under question is the thing that we discuss. Tonight, what Jesus said about hell. Now, the first thing he said about it is that nobody ought to go there but the devil and his angels. Now, I'm glad he said that. Because this gives me a way out. What do you say? A lot of people think that hell is for evil men. The Bible says no. Jesus says hell is for the devil and his angels. I find that in Matthew 25 and verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Ladies and gentlemen, while hell is prepared for the devil and his angels, Jesus is talking to some people. He is telling them to depart into everlasting fire. But it wasn't prepared for you, he says. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. Nevertheless, some of you human beings insist on going to hell. Well, Jesus is going to accommodate you. When he separates the sheep from the goat, uh, the sinners on the left hand and the righteous on the right, he's going to say to the sinners, Go where you have no business going. Jesus is the only one qualified to tell anybody to go to hell. <laughs> but that's exactly what this verse says. He's going to turn to the sinners and say, go to hell. And they are going. But then he says something that's going to make every Christian happy. He's going to say, you Christians were smart. I never prepared hell for you to start with, and you were smart enough not to go there. 
One of the big differences between a sinner and a Christian is that a sinner doesn't have all of his marbles. If he did have them, he wouldn't be going to hell. Now, that's the first thing Jesus had to say about hell. Now, later on, he said something else about it. In Luke chapter 16, he uh, told a parable about the rich man and Lazarus. And a lot of people get hung up in the parable and miss the point of the parable. Uh, Jesus talks about the rich man faring sumptuously while he was alive and Lazarus eating the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. You remember that story. And uh, the rich man died and went to hell. Now the reason I know it's a parable is because hell hasn't started burning yet. Do you understand? That's how I know it's a parable. But according to the parable, the rich man dies, go to hell, and Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom. Now that's another dead giveaway that it's a parable and not an actual description of hell. Because Abraham doesn't have a bosom big enough to hold Lazarus. Are you listening? So Christ is simply giving an illustration and not describing actually what goes on when hell burns. But then, let's go on with the parable. Uh, the rich man gets to hell and he talks back to Lazarus. He says, Lazarus, go tell my brothers not to come to this place. Uh, warn them. And will you dip your finger in some water and cool my scorching tongue? For I'm tormented in this flame. Now that's another dead giveaway that it's a parable. Because when hell burns, sinners may shout at each other. But when we learn uh, the situation of the man in hell and the man in heaven, there's no way that a sinner can holler to heaven. Are you listening? Now, now there you get another thing. Here, Abraham's bosom represents heaven. Well, how in the world is Lazarus going to leave heaven and come back down to the earth and look up the rich man's brothers? Are you listening to me? No sensible man that ever gets to heaven will ever leave. (laughs) Are you listening to me? For a frivolous thing like that. I want you to know, if I get there, don't call me. (laughs) I'll tell you in plain language, I'm not coming. Number one, I'm not listening. When I get out of Birmingham... I'm going to be so glad to be gone, I don't even plan to look back, let alone come back. So we've got a parable here, and the point of the parable is what I want to bring to you. Uh, Lazarus' answer is, they have, your brothers, they have Moses and the prophets. Would you want me to read that? Well, here it is, Luke chapter 16. And let's take a look at verse 31. And this is what it says. And he said unto him, this is the Lazarus, said to the rich man, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose From the dead. Now, now, now it seems to me, without preaching on the state of the dead, you might want to look at that phrase there. Uh, (laughs) The dead don't come down. They rise. Look at it. They have Moses and the prophets. 
if they won't hear them, neither would they listen if somebody rose from the dead. That ought to tell you something about where dead folk go. But that's not for tonight, okay? All right. We're, we're studying what Jesus said about hell. And the point of this parable is not to locate hell or even tell you what's going on there. It's to tell you that if you won't listen to the prophet, 66 books, 1,189 chapters in this book, 31,173 verses in this book, 776,746 words in this book, Moses. And the prophets, if you won't hear them, you wouldn't listen if somebody came from the dead and tried to warn you not to go to hell. That's what Jesus said about hell. Interesting? I said, interesting? Yeah. <laughs> but wait a minute, it gets better. Uh, in the Bible, the word hell, you'll find the Hebrew word sheol, meaning a place of the dead, and that's talking about the grave. You'll find the word Hades, that's the Greek word, talking about the grave. you find the word Gehenna, and that's the subject of the sermon tonight. That's a place of burning. Now, those are the three words uh, that you will find in your uh, study of the theology of hell. Uh, I think you ought to know we're not talking about the grave, we're not talking about Sheol, and we're not talking about Hades. We're talking about Gehenna. Now, Gehenna is the hell fire that everybody wants to miss. Hades is the hell with no fire that everybody's going to hit. For it is appointed unto all men once to die. So, honey, when you die, they're going to put you in the grave. You're going to Hades. And uh, I'll have to stand there over you like I did a couple of Fridays ago in No Raleigh, North Carolina, and say dust to dust, and the undertaker throws a flower down, dust to dust, and then ashes to ashes, throws another flower, and then you say the benediction, and they let that, uh, that uh, casket down into the soil, and then they cover it over. You have gone to Hades. You have gone to Sheol. That's the he Sheol, the Greek, uh, she Sheol, the Hebrew, Hades, the Greek, for the grave. And the grave is called hell. So every time you look in the Bible and you see hell, it's not talking about the burning hell. That's all I'm saying to you now. Uh, but we're talking about the burning hell tonight. What did Jesus say about that? I think you ought to know something else about Jesus and hell. In 2 Peter chapter 3, and I want you to look at verse 9, you ought to know that uh, Christ doesn't want anybody to be there. Uh, the Lord is not slack concerning his premises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, he tells us first that hell is prepared for the devils and his angels, and not for you. He tells you second, that Jesus is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm talking about the love of God. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in Revelation 1.18, you'd be surprised at what the Lord did to keep us out of hell. In Revelation 1.18, Jesus said, I have the keys. Mm -hmm. I am he that liveth and was dead. Now, if you've got an expensive Bible, that's written in red in your Bible. If you've got a cheap Bible, it's black. 
Keep coming out here and we'll give you an expensive Bible. Hopefully. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Now, if Jesus said amen, you ought to say it now and then. Amen. Thank you. And he added, I have the keys of hell and death. Now, I'm going to stop there and squeeze that piece of fruit for all the juice that I can find in it. I have the keys of hell and death. When did he get the keys to death? The answer is, on that Sunday morning, just before day, Christ broke the chains of death from his own body, rose again, appeared to Mary, told her to go tell the disciples to go before me into Galilee, and that same day went to heaven, and the Bible says that same day came back to the earth and walked with two men who were on the way to Emmaus and talked with them about his own crucifixion. The day of the resurrection, Christ took the keys of death in his hand and declared to all of his followers who die, death couldn't keep me in the ground, death can't keep you in the ground. If a man die, he shall live again. He got the keys of death when he conquered death. He got the keys of death when he defied death and proved himself superior to death. You know, it's surprising to me that those educated Roman emperors and Roman soldiers and Jewish elite leaders didn't have any better sense than to put him in the ground and think that he would stay there. He who created the ground was supposed to be imprisoned in the ground. Now, now ladies and gentlemen, they should have known better. I, I, I wasn't even there, and I know better. You see, the creator of matter. I read to you last night that Christ created the world. And then if you weren't here last night, I'll give you the text. Colossians 1.16. Christ created the world. Now, now look at, look at him here. Wrapped up in a human body that he picked up from Mary. Let's do this for you. <laughs> Let's do it right. God the Father said to God the Son out, out there in eternity, the fullness of time has come. God the Son said to the Holy Ghost, prepare me a body. Holy Ghost said to Gabriel, find Mary. I did that for you. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost in Luke 1.35 uh, wind up in front of Mary. I mean, Gabriel did. And he said, hail, Mary. Uh, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. I'm reading verse 35. Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. Power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. What a magnificent text. What a magnificent nugget to nibble on here tonight. What he really said was, not that the Holy Ghost would sexually cohabit with Mary. When he said the Holy Ghost shall, come, up, shall come upon thee, he simply meant, that the Holy Ghost will take charge of you and superintend, listen to me carefully, superintend the passage of divinity through your humanity. 
And as he's passing through you, that holy thing, that holy thing that shall be born of thee, while he's passing through, he's going to pick up enough flesh and enough blood to be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And that's what he did. And when he got through Mary, he was the God-man. When he started through her body, superintended by the Holy Ghost, <laughs> he was God. But he picked up flesh and he picked up blood, so we got to call him the God-man. God had to have enough man so that he could bleed. For Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Uh-huh. So God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. John 3.16, uh, 17. But that the world through him might be saved. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that could save the world was that the creator should die for the creature. The manufacturer has to be responsible for the product. Oh, my Lord. Man, you're not ready for me tonight. Man sinned and became damaged goods. If you buy a car and it turns out to be a lemon, take it back to the manufacturer. You don't take a Ford to the Chrysler country company. You don't take a Lincoln to the Cadillac company. You go back where you bought the thing. Did you hear what I said? And the company assumes responsibility, or at least it should. Well, Golgotha was the creator assuming responsibility for the damaged goods that he had put into the world. Man, sin, Jesus said, I love you, I'm not going to let you go. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so he came out of the womb of a woman with some physical insulation. You see, God is a spirit. And a spirit is like a live wire. You don't touch a live wire that's got no insulation. Jesus was going to walk around this earth for 33 years. People were going to be rubbing up against him. He didn't want them dropping dead. Jesus didn't come here to kill us. He came here to save us. Talk to me. So he had to put on some insulation so that when the woman got close enough to touch the hem of his garment, instead of dropping dead, she stood up well. Look, I don't have time to preach to you tonight because I don't think you're ready. By Tuesday night, I think you'll be ready for me. So then, so then, so then, when Jesus rose from the grave, he picked up the keys of death. But there's something even more fascinating. He said, I've got the keys of hell. And I read that and I looked and said, where did you get them? I know where you got the keys of death when you rose. But when in the name of all that is righteous, did you get your hands, O oh Lord, on the keys of hell? And the answer came on Good Friday. On Good Friday. Well, you better talk about that a little bit. Well, turn to Mark 15, 34. Hanging on the cross on Good Friday. Christ cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabethani. Mm -hmm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, 
God of me. Uh, let's read it like it really reads. It doesn't read, my God, my God, why? It reads, God of me, God of me, why hast thou forsaken me? I'm, I'm teaching that. At that moment, he was in hell. I didn't say hell fire. The, I told you in advertising this sermon, some of you don't know the difference between hell and hell fire. There's all kinds of hell. Some of y'all catching hell in your marriage. Are you listening to me? See, you got no difference between hell and hellfire. You know what hell is? Hell is separation from God. Whether you be walking on this earth, if you are a sinner, separated from God, you are already experiencing hell. Your life is hell. And all you're waiting for is hellfire. See, now we'll get there. Don't worry about it. You students, don't get disturbed. Let's just point out what hell is. The thing, when hell fire burns, I have it on good authority. The thing that's going to trouble you if you happen to go get, get caught up in hell fire is not so much the burning as the thought that you are eternally separated from God and can't get back. Now, now, I wish I could tell you where I read that. I read that from an authority uh, that uh, transcends human writing. A and this is what started me thinking along this line. Hell, if you don't say hell fire, you don't identify the hell. That people, that people in all kinds of hell. Separated from God, hell. That's what it is. And when Christ said, God of me, God of me, why hast thou forsaken me? He was experiencing what sinners will experience in hellfire. A sense of not being connected with God. He had to tread the winepress alone. And in the loneliness of isolation, his very soul felt what every sinner will feel when fully and finally separated from God. If Christ didn't go to hell, I've got to go. The only way that he can save me from hell is to go there for me. And he did it Friday. When a mantle, I'm going to quote another authority here, when a mantle of darkness was dropped around that cross so that Christ in his humanity would not sense the presence of his father. He was in hell. And he cried out in the language of another writer, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He was talking in Hebrew. God of me, God of me. Why? If he hadn't gone to hell that Friday, honey, wouldn't be no chance that you and I could miss it. He had to get the keys of hell so he could lock hell's door against you. Great day in the morning. He's got to be able to lock hell's door so that no Christian can ever get in there. And he said, I've got the keys. Of death and hell. All right, let's close. So, uh, 
uh, when hell does burn, it will be hell fire. Uh, in Second Peter, the third chapter, and the tenth verse, I think you ought to know what it's going to be like. But the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night, meaning unexpectedly. Did you hear what I said? This does not mean that he's coming privately. It means he's coming unexpectedly. You got that? Come as a thief in the night in which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also, listen to this, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That's why I told you a few minutes ago, hell is not burning right now. Because when hell, when hell does burn, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Let me read it again. In Malachi, what book did I say? In Malachi chapter 4, and the verse is 1. And I read, Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. You will notice that language, the day cometh. The day is coming. That's why I told you hell is not burning now. The day is coming. That shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. So please don't walk out of here and say, that old man said, uh uh, it says, the Lord of hosts said this. The day that cometh shall burn them up, and it shall leave them. Neither root nor branch. That's hell fire. Any separation from God is hell. But hell fire stands alone as the ultimate separation. And I'm going to drop this one on you and let you go. Anything else would be too much for your brain tonight. Hell fire is the ultimate separation. Because in Second Peter the third chapter, last thought, Second Peter the third chapter, verses six and seven, tells you what hell fire is going to be made of. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved, unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Ladies and gentlemen, hell is going to be like Noah's flood. You remember Noah reigned 40 days, 40 nights, destroyed a whole generation of people, and the black man wrote, God sent Noah, the rainbow sign, it won't be water, fire, next time. That old slave knew something. The waters covered the earth in the flood, in Noah's day. If you want to know what hell's going to be like. Men and animals Hold up for the high ground until they were all finally enveloped in a sea of oceanic waters. Even the highest mountain peaks were covered. That was a hell of water. But this last thing is going to get it done. What the water didn't get done, the fire is going to do. 
The Lord left eight people here. And them eight people became eight billion people. That's what's here now. And heaven knows what these eight billion folk are doing on this planet. But the Lord says, stay close to me. I'm getting ready to do it again. But this time, I'm not going to use water. I'm going to use fire. Men will run to the rocks, hide their face. Rocks cry out, no hiding place. They'll run to the caves, saying, what'll we do? Caves say, fool, we burning too. <laughs> no hiding place down here. The earth, Peter said, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. This says that even the heavens are going to be on fire. That's talking about the atmospheric heaven. That's talking about the air that envelops this planet. Oh, my Lord. Describe it to them, Cleveland, and let them go. The air you breathe is made up of combustibles, combustible gases, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen. Isn't God good? When he compounded chemically, let me talk to your head for a moment. Then we'll let this brother sing and send you home. <laughs> when the master chemist compounded the chemical formula of matching hydrogen with oxygen with nitrogen with helium and other combustible gases, any one of which could incinerate the earth, but when he put them together, they became life-sustaining instead of life-destroying. Now, the Almighty doesn't have much to do to set this world on fire. He put the chemical formula together. That's what Peter says. Heavens and the earth are being reserved to the fire. Of the perdition of the ungodly men. Hell fire. It's going to be the earth on fire. Well, wait a minute now. The reason there won't be any place for you to hide is that the air is going to be on fire. The master chemist will upset his own formula. And instead of one pot, Nitrogen with two parts, helium. All he's got to do is up the helium, upset the balance, and you got an explosion in space. Talk to me. So the world is going to be in flames, in the air. Then he's going to touch the water. Now, we know what he did there. He put two parts hydrogen with one part oxygen so that the formula for water is H2O. All he's got to do is turn that two to a three. <laughs> now the ocean is on fire. Well, wait a minute, he's not through. Now, when he made the earth, he put some coal under Alabama. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's got some sulfur out, out, out in the Dakotas. They call that brimstone. You know, the, the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. Well, we got a lot of brimstone down under the surface of the... And in Texas, oil. oil. My oil will blow. Coal will burn. And when the water mixes with the sulfur and the coal, you say, how's that going to be? Well, it... When the Lord shows up down here to judge the nations and to consign men to hell, Isaiah said that the earth is... Isaiah 24, chapter. The earth... Don't read it now. It's there, honey. Just listen to me. If you ain't read it before now, don't fool with it now. Just listen to me. He said the earth is going to reel to and fro like a drunken which means 
that he's going to shake this world up like a mama shakes a disobedient child. And I tell you, mama got hold of me sometimes. It looked like my stomach was going up into my chest. And my heart was going down into my abdomen. She could shake. But when the Lord comes and shakes the earth, the petition underground that separates the coal from the oil and the coal and the oil from the sulfur and the coal and the oil and the sulfur from the water. And it will all run together and there will be these seismic explosions called vo volcanic eruptions. Oh my Lord. No wonder somebody saying, no hiding place down here. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy. And to our God, who will abundantly pardon. Sing, brother. Like a ship that's tossed. And driven better by a name and receive. You know when the storms of life are raging and the fury falls on me. What it is that I've done Oh, that makes this race So hard to run Then I say to my soul Take courage Oh, the Lord He'll make a way somehow you know the Lord will make a way somehow. Whoa, when beneath the cross I bow, you know that He will take away all sorrow. So heavy, the weight is shown down on my brow. You know that there's a sweet relief in knowing oh, the Lord can make a way somehow. You know that the Lord. He'll make a way somehow. God will win beneath the cross I'm by. You know that He will take away all your sorrows. Yes, if you let Him take your burdens right now. Heavy, so heavy that the weight is shown down on your brow. You know that there's 
a sweet release. I said, there's a sweet release. You know that there's a sweet release. In the morning, there's a sweet release. At night, there's a sweet release. In the noonday, there's a sweet release. Early in the morning, there's a sweet release. Hey, there's a sweet release. And knowing, whoa, that the Lord will make a way. Lord, somehow. Lay you by your heads. Have faith in God. He knows the doubts you feel. Have faith in God. In Him is power to heal. Have faith in God. Stay on the battlefield. Have faith, dear friend, in God. We'll be back here Tuesday night. No meeting tomorrow night. Prayer for healing. Tuesday night. The subject, love, courtship, and marriage. And until we meet again, God be in us to sustain us, above us to shelter us, beneath us to uphold us, before us to guide us, and behind us to protect us now, henceforth and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Good night. God bless. Sing a little more of that while they're going out. Sing a little more. While they... Lord, yeah. make a way yeah. Yeah. somehow. Oh. Whoa, when beneath cross I'm by, you know he will take away your sorrow. Oh. If you let him have your burdens right now, yeah, you know when the load comes down so heavy, oh, the weight is felt down on my pride. You know there's a Sweet relief and knowing oh, oh, the Lord can make a way somehow.